Your lunchtime programmes on Monday are Gran at 1.25 and then at 1.30 the first in a new series about Hugo, Man of the Snows, who decides to leave the mountains and go to live with the Professor and his family. Now and two we look at how our language works in Walrus. <laughs> From the time we're very young, we need to communicate, to make friends with people, or to get them to do things for us. Quite early in life, babies start using sounds to communicate. And before very long, they're using actual words. At three years old, most children can use more than a thousand different words. That used to be a ticket. Super traffic carries on the sand now. And that's a bulldozer. Look, it's in here now. Now the spot for lots. He's eating up. And the little tractor. I picked the one. I'm the one who pats it down. Yeah. And you're the one who puts it on. So children have learned how to use very many words long before they go to school. By the time they're in secondary school, children are beginning to feel at home with words that are written down. Not only listening and speaking now, but reading and writing too. What's this called? Adventure in Scotland. Hi, mind where you're going. Um, but even the ones who are getting extra help with reading and writing don't normally have the problem of not knowing enough words. Well, you have to change the size. What's the name of that? Oh, I've done it. I've got it. Oh, well, that I'll bit's be. the grip and that's uh, the arrow wrist. What are these, then? They're the limbs. What's that numbers on? Two. Oh, that tells you what weight it is to pull. By the age of 11 or 12, pretty well everybody knows thousands of words. But words on their own don't mean much. They need other words round them. But not any old how. You have to put them in order. But it's still not easy to see what the meaning's meant to be. If these words are going to make meaning clearly, they need to be put in groups, like this. I love you. Get lost. Will you meet me tonight? I'm sorry, but I can't. Why not? I'm washing my hair. What's this, Nigel? I know. Words in groups. Look at the words in the red rings. The words are in groups. For each card you have to write down how many groups. How are the groups kept separate from each other? There might be spaces between the groups. For each group words perhaps are a bit like the parts of a bike. First of all, because you've got more of them than you'd think. A person might know thousands of words, and a bike contains up to 2,000 separate parts. And also because bike parts, like words, are only really useful when you put them together. But you don't put them together any old how. The parts go in groups. This group of parts makes a hub. 
and a hub joins with spokes. And later the rim to make a wheel. These parts all go together. Spokes, all the hub parts, and the rim. They make a group. They belong more closely to each other than they do to the other parts of the bike. The handlebars, for instance. These parts make another group. First the red pad goes on, then on the assembly line the other handlebar parts are added, the brake levers and the handlebar grips. These handlebar parts belong more closely to each other than they do to the other parts of the bike. In the bike factory, small groups go together to make larger groups. The finished bike is a group of parts. The parts of one bike belong more closely to each other than they do to other bikes. So in many ways, bike parts are just like words. They go together in groups. You can find words in groups. Just go out in the street and look around. Here's a group of words. It's made up of three smaller groups. Let's look at just one of them. And this group is made up of groups that are even smaller. Three of them. A top group, a middle group, and a bottom group. Here's another sign with three groups. At the left and right and at the top. Look at the top group. It's made up of smaller groups. Two of them. The words West and Drayton belong together. They make the first group. The words Heathrow and Airport belong together. They make the second group. All over the place, there are words in groups. The words in different groups may have a different job to do. To show you who put the notice up, to give you the main message, to add a detail. To tell you something's for sale and who's selling it and what number to ring to find out more. To tell you who the message is for, then to tell you what they have to do first and what next. On all these different signs, you need to be able to see where each group begins and ends. Sometimes the letters in different groups are in different sizes, like this. Or this or in different colours, like this. They can be in different colours and different sizes. Sometimes different styles of lettering are used. The first group could be in capital letters. A heading in capital letters is very common. And something else you can see here. Different groups on different lines. That's very common too. Wherever you find words, they're likely to be in groups. You can look for groups of words anywhere, in the street, at home, or at school. But didn't colours in sizes? Yeah. One, two, two. three, four, four five. five. Five down. 
By different size letters. Yeah, and different colours. It's not different colours though. The language we speak is more than just words. Other important parts of it are its rhythm and tune. Dai? Dai? Where are you? I know you're down here somewhere. Dai? Old woman, oh. what are you doing down here? You gave me quite a turn. I came down the mine shaft to give my Dai his lunch, see? He forgot it. I must have taken the wrong turn then. Who are you then? I am a Dalek. My mission on this planet is to make all humans speak properly on one note, like me. Well, uh, I'm Bloodwin. And I couldn't speak on one note if I tried. Your way of speaking is ridiculous. No, it isn't, Flower. We all speak like this in Wales. It adds a bit of interest, you know, variety. I do not like variety. Well, never you mind. You just stay down here, then you won't have to listen, isn't it? Now, I must find my dye. Excuse me. Exterminate. Oh, there's lovely. People who aren't Welsh often say that a Welsh accent is more musical than others. But really, all accents are spoken with rhythm and tune. We put spoken words into groups by using rhythm and tune. My favourite food is chocolate cake, steak, chips, beef burgers. There are five words in that list, but only four favourite foods, because chocolate and cake go together to make a group. We can see this clearly in the editing room. My favourite food is chocolate cake, steak, chips, beef burgers. The editor can mark the four groups with a pen, just as the speaker marked them with the rhythm and tune in his voice. My favourite food is chocolate cake, steak, chips, beef burgers. Someone else, with a different meaning in mind, uses a different rhythm and tune. My favourite foods are chocolate, cake, steak, chips, beef burgers. The same words, but a different rhythm and tune. My favourite foods are chocolate, cake, steak, chips, beef burgers. So now it's five foods instead of four. My favourite foods are chocolate, cake, steak, chips, beef burgers. But enough of favourites. Things I hate. Curry, snakes, roast potatoes, getting up in the morning. We're going to edit this list. Curry, snakes, roast potatoes, getting So that we'll see something else about the way we use rhythm and tune. Things I hate. Curry, snakes. We're going to take a word from the middle of the list. We're going to get rid of the word snakes. Now the question is, when we listen to the playback, will we hear that the tape's been edited? Things I hate. Curry, roast potatoes, getting up in the morning. And the answer is surely no. It sounds like a perfectly proper list, even though it's a shorter one. Curry, roast potatoes, getting up in the morning. But now we're going to start again and edit in a different way. So first, we have to put the snakes back in. This time, instead of taking something from the middle of the list, we're going to take something from the end. We'll take away getting up in the morning. Yeah. Will we be able to hear that the tape's been edited this time? Things I hate. Curry, snakes, best potatoes.
And the answer is surely yes. The list does sound unfinished. It doesn't end properly. Curry, snakes, roast potatoes. When you speak a list so that it ends properly, you say the last words with a tune that goes down. Getting up in the morning. And that falling tune, which we say so easily and automatically, marks the end of a group. Curry, snakes, roast potatoes, getting up in the morning. But it's time we had a joke. Knock, knock. Who's there? Granny. Granny who? Knock, knock. Who's there? Granny. Granny who? Now, keeping those same words in the same order, they could be said with a different rhythm and tune. Knock, knock. Who's there? Granny, granny. Who? So making different groups. Knock, knock. Who's there? Granny, granny. Who? Or yet another way. Knock, knock. Who's there, granny? Granny. Who? If you want a different meaning, you automatically knock, use knock. a different rhythm and tune to put the words granny. in different groups. Who? But a joke needs a punchline. Knock, knock. Who's there? Aunt. Aunt who? Aren't you glad you got rid of all those grannies? Oh. In both speaking and writing, our words are in groups. They're not always the right groups. German place, you know. Oh, it's such a long time since he's written. Naughty boy. I thought his unit might have moved on. Shall I read it to you? What? Oh, all right then. Let's see. Dear Mum and Dad, I'm writing to tell you I'm going out with a nice girl called Bert. What? Funny name for a girl. Oh, him and his full stops. I'm writing to tell you I'm going out with a nice girl. Call Bert, that's his mate, Bert, to tell him her eyes are blue. What do you want to tell him that for? Oh, I see. Call Bert to tell him. Her eyes are blue and she has lovely long fair hair which she wears up her nose. Wears up her nose? Do what? Oh, lovely long fair hair which she wears up. Her nose? Turns up wherever we go. Oh, stands to reason, doesn't it? Her nose turns up. Oh. Wherever we go, people stare at her behind. Oh, really, Alfie, what a thing to say. Silly me, people stare at her, full stop. Behind my bed at the army camp, I have her picture next to yours, Mum. Oh, isn't that nice, Fred? So I can kiss you both good night every night. In spite of the flies. Charming. Oh, it's kiss you both good night every night. In spite of the flies, which seem to be everywhere at this time of year, we are all enjoying most of our tour of duty out here. Although it can be a pain in the neck thinking of you. Here, cheek. Although it can be a pain in the neck. Oh, I see, yes. Thinking of you and hoping to be home on leave soon. Your loving son, Flowers. Son Flowers? He's gone mad. Oh, no, your loving son. Flowers are on the way for your birthday. Oh, Fred, isn't that nice? Love, Alfie. <laughs> when people write letters, they usually put words into groups with punctuation marks, like full stops. And to help full stops show up, we follow them with a capital letter. We also use commas and a few other punctuation marks as well. When all the punctuation marks are there, the groups of words show up more clearly. Putting words into groups is so easy for us when we speak. It can't be too hard for us to learn to do when we're writing.
a couple of minutes after the news, it's you and me, and then we get a taste of the imminent offerings from the Open University in Weekend Outlook at 2.15. Then at 2.25, there's racing from Newbury. In a change to the programme shown in Radio Times, holiday outing at 4.20 takes us to Nepal. Then at 4.30, a further celebration of Sir John Betjeman, who died five years ago, as we visit the places he knew as a child. Concluding her series at 5.30, the celebrated organist Gillian Weir plays and talks about an organ built by the famous 19th century French builder Cavalli Cole in The King of Instruments. And that concludes the afternoon ahead on BBC Two. And now the news with Moira Stewart. And from the newsroom, the main story is at two o'clock. The Chinese Prime Minister, Li Peng, says his government intends to take measures to stop what he called the chaos in Peking. He didn't specify what the measures would be. There are conflicting reports over whether students are going to call off their hunger strike. And there are also reports that the Communist Party leader, Zhao Ziyang, has offered his resignation, but it's not clear whether it's been accepted. Here, the inflation rate has gone up to 8%, the highest level in nearly seven years. Increased petrol, gas, water and electricity prices have pushed up the figure. A woman who lives near Hillsborough has told the inquiry into last month's disaster that she saw scores of drunken Liverpool fans walking past her home shortly before the kickoff. She says fans were using her garden as a toilet and some became abusive when she complained. Next news at three o'clock. Now with the weather, Ian McGaskill. Hello. Well, for most of us, a warm, bright, humid weekend, but there is, I have to tell you, an increasing risk of showers all the time. Just at the moment, there are some bands of cloud over the north of Wales and the north of England and over southern Scotland too. And there will be, we think, one or two thunderstorms breaking out over North Wales and the uh, southern part of the uh, Pennines there as we go through the afternoon. The rest of us dry, very warm in lands in the south, cool near that eastern and southern coast, fresher uh, and 14 Celsius up in northern districts. That's 57 Fahrenheit. This is BBC Two. Now you and me, when Dibs has a very peculiar dream. You and me, me and me, lots and lots for you to do, lots and lots for you to see. Me and you, you and me. I've lost Kong. Cos, have you seen Kong? Yes. He was hungry, so he went to Larry's cafe to get a sandwich. No, 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 no. Kong doesn't eat anything. Kong's a toy. Yes, I know. I was only joking. No, I don't know where he is, but you can ask Harry. Maybe he sold him? No! Yeah, and now he's making a quick getaway. Harry! Uh-huh? Have you seen Kong? I don't think so. Well, could you help us look for him? Oh, I'm sorry, Cos. I can't stop. I've got to pick up that armchair from Mrs. DeLacy. Here, I got these for you. <gasps> Peaches! Delicious. Thanks very much, Harry. I hope you're fine, Kong. See you later. I must fly. Why did he say he must fly? Um, he just meant he was in a hurry. I thought he meant he was really going to fly. <laughs> that would be unusual. <laughs> Here, here's your peach. Oh, thank you. Now don't drop it, because it will fall on the floor and get squashed. <gasps> it might not. It might do something completely different. Hey, this is good. Better than the market. See you later. Must fly. What's that? It's a bird. No, it isn't. Wait a minute. It can't be. It is. It's Harry. See you later. Must fly. Harry, wait. Where are you going? Don't drop your peach. It'll fall and get squashed. Peach? <gasps> Delicious.
Never mind, Bib. Cosmo? Cosmo, where are you? I can't stop. Guess what? I found Kong. <laughs> where is he? Here he comes. I told you he was hungry. Kong? Is that you? It's me, your friend, Dibs. Night's Kong. Cosmo, it was only a dream. Yeah, hey, guess what? I've got some good news. I've found dear old Kong. <laughs> What's wrong? Thanks very much, Cos. But I think I'll play with him tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Hello, Sherbert. What's up? We had a race when I was last. Never mind. It doesn't matter. It's only a race. Mm. But I knew I'd last. I've got an idea. Come on. Now, you came first, didn't you? Yeah. And you came second. Hello, Sherbert. Hello. Do you want another race? Yeah. Great. Sun on the right, 
Yeah? And the moon. Okay? Still right? That one is down. Is it down? It's down. It's not too bad. Uh, do the hustas. Can you sing the hustas song now? Right? Together. Nicely in front and make the bee come slowly. Yeah, Allah Padma. Brahmara. And your eyes, eyebrows, bright. Yeah. <laughs> Never mind. Let's just do the. Let's see if we can do just like that. There. See? Very good. Right. Yikes. You passed me one. Give me one. Okay. Right? Yes. Now I've got to put on the costume. There, I've finished with the jingle. Right. Amma's got to go and dance now. Shall we do the Tati Namaskar? Do it with me. Taka di mi. 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 Okay, I've got to go and dance now. Shall we go and look for Papa? Come on. What? Me flying? <laughs> in an armchair, <laughs> eating a peach. Yes. Was I enjoying it, do you think, Dibs? I think so, Harry. <laughs> I mean, you went on smiling and waving all the time. <laughs> it was quite a nice dream until Kong turned up. Well, I tell you what. Let's forget that bit and we'll sing a song instead. Yeah, good idea, because that will make him forget everything. <laughs> okay, Dibs, your choice. What will huh? it be? Keep on dancing. Keep on dancing. It is. Keep on dancing. Keep on dancing. Keep on singing this song. Keep on dancing. Keep on dancing. Keep on singing this song. Clap your hands and stamp your feet. Wiggle your noses to the beat. Wiggle your noses. Wiggle your noses. Keep on singing this song. Keep on dancing, keep on dancing, keep on singing this song. Keep on dancing, keep on dancing, keep on singing this song. Clap your hands and stamp your feet. Shake your shoulders to the beat. Shake your shoulders, shake your shoulders. Wiggle your noses, wiggle your noses. Keep on singing this song. Keep on dancing, keep on dancing, keep on singing. 
of young children who are interested in following up UME programmes can receive helpful information by sending an A4 stamped addressed envelope with 32p postage to you and me, BBC Education, London, W12, 7RJ. In 10 minutes, we've racing from Newbury with Julian Wilson. Now a look at some forthcoming Open University highlights in Weekend Outlook. This weekend, the Open University brings you images of progress and change in the 18th century, in the changing countryside, in the teaching of mathematics to young children, and lastly, in the changing methods of teaching oral English. But first, let's go back to the period known as the Enlightenment, to a dinner given by Baron Dolbach where the issues of the day were debated by such philosophers as Diderot and Rousseau. Jean-Jacques, when you talk of the golden age and man and the spirit of nature, I long to go on all fours again. <laughs> <laughs> but don't you agree that we have gone forward a little since the infancy of mankind? I mean, hasn't there been a revolution in man's way of thinking? And Carlton, won't the next generation have a great way of life? It may not be what you expect. Uh, what do you mean by that? I believe we've become slaves to our possessions. We have tastes we don't need. More wine, son. Oh, yes, yes. We turn our fellow men into servants to minister to our vices. Which wine, sir? Will you change to the burgundy? Oh, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Dinner at yes. Baron Dolbach's is on Saturday morning at 10 to 7. From the 18th century to changes in the countryside. This programme looks at the politics of change in the environment. The Changing Countryside is on Saturday afternoon at 20 to 1. And from changes in the environment to new methods in education, we look at the teaching of mathematics in a progressive primary school in Nottinghamshire. Right from the start, most children show an innate desire to experiment with the world around them and learn from the results. John Ditchment and his staff believe that many schools have failed to use this creative energy in formal classroom learning. So the staff at Lincroft School start in the nursery presenting children with problems to be solved, encouraging them to see different ways of finding solutions and to think through for themselves the implication of what they're doing. Learning maths together is on Saturday afternoon at a quarter past twelve. And lastly, from primary mathematics to the importance of talk in the secondary school. This programme looks at the ways English teachers are developing oral communication using role play. Hello, Kamaji. I'm your mother. Can you tell me what's happened, please? Can I drive the telegram? Is it you? The female bike. I don't have a bike. Can I get you? Bike shed. The female is on the road. The road cross. Can I get The female is on the road. The female is on the The headmaster is on the road. The female 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 is on I mean, better than can even with the plaster that did that. Right, and I'm, I'm your mate. Now, can you, what's happened to your uncle then? How'd you do that? Because you never believe it, right? I come down, I come down the drive and park my bike in the bike shed, and all of a sudden this twig comes along and it, it, it hits me. I mean, it's not funny. It's killing my foot. My foot was, and they, they got the headmaster. I had to see all, you know, <laughs> the headmaster, and then um, I had to go to the hospital to get my foot in a plaster. Uh, and they reckon it was my fault. Words to that effect is on Sunday morning at 25 past eight. These are just some of the many and varied programmes brought to you by the Open University this weekend. 
Details are in the Radio Times or on CFAX pages 176 and 276. That uh, left shoulder round. That's it. Okay. <laughs> well, what do you want? Tea or coffee? Um, whatever's easiest to pour, really, I think. <laughs> Unless we find someone to take that assertiveness class, they're going to be here all day. <laughs> Good, well, um, is there anything that you'd like to ask me? <laughs> take a trip down Tygo Road tonight at 9 on 2. We go racing at Newbury in five minutes on two after an extra programme, The History Man. Here in the quiet Northamptonshire countryside lived one of Elizabethan England's great eccentrics, Sir Thomas Tresham. He had this hobby of building weird and wonderful buildings all around his estates. This is probably the oddest of the lot, the Rushton Triangular Lodge. This is the lodge he designed for his gamekeeper. And what's amazing about this place is it's triangular. And it's not just a building, it's a symbol of Sir Thomas's devotion to the Holy Trinity. Now Sir Thomas was into making his point with numbers and everything about this building is connected with the figure three. Each side is 33 feet long, has three stories, with three windows to each story, surmounted by three gables surrounding a triangular roof, and the whole lot is topped off with a triangular chimney. Each side has an entablature with an inscription of 33 letters, referring to different and very often obscure biblical passages, and the emblems refer to different aspects of the Trinity. Now this one, the pelican in her piety, feeding the young with her own flesh, refers to Christ sacrificing himself for mankind. So there you are. Sir Thomas was a very precise man with a very mathematical mind. Mind you, he liked his little jokes as well. That's why he only had nine kids. Not that Sir Thomas had an awful lot to laugh about because he was a Roman Catholic. And Roman Catholics in Elizabethan England were public enemy number one. You've got to remember that the Spanish Armada's coming against us every five minutes and the Pope is actively encouraging all sorts of nutters to try and assassinate the Queen. So you can understand why people saw Catholics as a threat to the monarchy. Poor Sir Thomas spent about 13 years of his life banged up inside. But in his later years, he decided to retire to the peace and quiet of his gardens here at Lyveton. But this spectacular little affair isn't the manor house. This is just the summer house, the pleasant days in the garden, with its arbours, bowling green, orchards, roses, even a fish pond. See, despite the heavy fines he'd had to pay, he was still well healed and had plenty of style. And the garden and its attendant manor house were going to look absolutely magnificent. Mind you, this building wasn't just stylish simplicity, quite the opposite. The whole business was meant to symbolize the passion and death of Jesus. So the house was built in a crucifix shape with all sorts of obscure symbolism. <laughs> Sadly, it was never finished. Just when the government had finally begun to give him a quiet life, his own family started giving him a hard time. His daughter ran off with a servant, and Sir Thomas refused to give her or her arrant varlet of a husband a penny, so they sued him, and they had him clapped in jail for death. He'd no sooner got himself free when his son Francis got himself arrested for high treason, and Dad had to move heaven and earth to get him off the hook, not to mention payment of a £3,000 fine. So with all that sort of hassle, it's hardly surprising that poor old Sir Thomas never quite got the place finished. But the really sad bit from our point of view is that during the Civil Wars 40 years later, a local roundhead with a good eye for cheap building supplies dismantled what there was and had the timbers away for his own house.
the race is on. With the Formula One season underway, Murray Walker introduces the Grand Prix 89 magazine. A wealth of background and analysis to keep you in touch as you view. Check out the teams, compare the circuits, and meet the magnificent seven. Pay a flying visit to the pits or fly away to the Portuguese Grand Prix in our great competition. The Grand Prix 89 magazine, new from BBC Sports here, available now at your newsagent. Now on to coverage of today's racing from Newbury. Warning became Britain's top miler in 1988. Today he takes his first step towards retaining his title. Well, hello and welcome to Newbury on the annual charity day. Today's charity is the Police Convalescent Home, and it couldn't be a better afternoon for racing. It's warm and sunny, but uh, there's a nice cool breeze as well uh, to make it not too hot. And, uh, well, the ground officially good to firm, but the jockeys who rode in the first race said that it's good ground, almost perfect, in fact, perfect for top-class racing. And that's what we've got today, and the big race in particular, the Judmont Locking Stakes, the highlight of our coverage, the clash between warning and reprimand for a first prize of over £33,000. That race is a 10 past three, as you can see. Before that, we have a 2.40, the Ultramar Stakes, over a mile and a half. A 3.40 is a second feature, the William Hill Phillies Trial, Formerly the Sir Charles Cole Memorial, before that the Sandalford Priory Stakes over a mile and a quarter. And six of the seven runners in that 